if you've been watching this series, you will know that the classic car restorations in it happen in stop motion. And we're just about to focus directly on the Lotus Esprit in the series. This is a perfect time to show you exactly how stop motion works for classic car restoration or at all. So what we've got here is a stills camera, some lighting, a subject, which is literally just a nut and bolt in the vise and a remote trigger that we may or may not call Mr. Squishy. And all that happens is you get out of frame and you take a photograph. Then you manipulate your subject matter. You get out of frame, you take a photograph. You manipulate your subject matter. Get out of frame, take a photograph, manipulate your subject matter. Bored yet? This goes on and on. And if you consider that this video is being delivered to you at 24 frames a second, that means it takes 24 frames to make up one second of footage. Then you can see that this quickly notches up a hell of a lot of photographs and takes a hell of a lot of time. It took four years all told to restore a Range Rover in the series. If you haven't seen that video, do check it out. I reckon had I not been doing it like this, it might've taken half that, probably even less. Now, this is the perfect scenario. I'm controlling the light. The subject matter is very easily manipulated and I don't have to get very far out of frame to take the photograph. This is not the case 90% of the time. There are so many factors that make this even more difficult. And I thought I would give you a few examples of those before we do get into the Esprit, which is coming up a bit later. Here you go. Check out this finished piece of footage. It's nice, it looks good, and you can see exactly what's happening. But from a production point of view, the frame shouldn't be jumping around the place. This is because the camera was exactly where I ideally needed to be to work on an item that was already in an awkward place. The camera by Sod's Law will always need to be where you need to be for easiest access. It is just as simple as if you want to get the prime viewing angle, that's where the camera is going to need to go, leaving you probably off to the side in some kind of a contortionist act, trying not to knock everything, which is what happened in this and many other sequences I shot, where it was just impossible to work in any kind of a decent time frame without knocking either the camera or the workpiece, and so adding this jitteriness to the shot. And you know, you'll probably tell me most people wouldn't notice it. Yeah but I notice it. Number two, lighting and shadow. The object of this shot was to bring in this big sucker to the middle of the windscreen just to aid me lifting the windscreen out. I'm commonly at the mercy of natural light and or house lights, which in this case is exactly what happened. Because of the prevailing light from skylights, which you can see reflected in the Esprit's windscreen, and the house lights that are almost directly above, there were a number of shadows that aren't even apparent in this piece of footage. That meant I had to back away almost 10 feet from the car to take each frame. Shadows in the corner of a shot or just off to the side can really distract the eye from the workpiece itself and can jar a viewer out of the viewing experience. Okay, distraction. Check this out. This is the kind of job that is very satisfying to see in stop motion because you know it's a laborious job. It takes effort, energy, and a lot of elbow grease. So to see it just happening quickly, even for me, even though I did this, <laughs> I felt the pain of it, is very rewarding. The trouble is when you're in the middle of a job like this and you're kind of keeping track of where you were working last in between each shot, if somebody or something comes to distract you, you can find yourself looking back at the job and wondering, when did I take that last shot? What was it looking at? Where was I working? And ideally you go back and you check the camera, the last frame in the camera to see where it was. But every time you touch the camera is a potential element of jitter you are going to add into the next frame. You may move the camera even just slightly by touching a button on it. In this case, one of the guy's dogs, Oscar, he just wants to play and he knows exactly how to get my attention too. Not only is this a distraction, but he just wants to be right in shot all the time. Number four, tools and dexterity. 
if you're going to do this in any kind of amount of time you need to be quick and precise because the tools have to come out a shot each time and then go back on the component for the next shot there's nothing worse than having an off day where your hand-eye coordination just isn't working for you and you're fumbling every time you go to replace the tool number five the post-production for every scene you've seen here i went home that evening and worked on the post-production i had to process each photograph the photographs are captured at very high quality but it's too much information it's too much data so essentially what happens is each photo is processed to reduce the file size first and foremost but also for color grading contrast the light can be different on each day so each day's work tends to need to be matched to the last in terms of how it looks so all of this factors into at least a couple of hours of an evening each evening of post-production and number six time just remember when you're working on your car there is at least one guy out there who is insanely jealous of you being able to just rock up and start working how long would it take you to roll your engine hoist up to your engine bay and place it over the engine 30 seconds a minute on the outside this has to be one of the greatest examples of how much extra time stop motion puts into some of the simplest acts This really hit home to me shortly after these scenes you're watching now because when I got the engine and gearbox on the ground and I started the job, the simple job, of just splitting the transmission off the back of the engine to get the two items separated and put the engine onto an engine stand took me eight hours. This is something that any guy who had any experience with a spanner could achieve in less than an hour, probably in less than half an hour. <laughs> this is not a clever way of being a youtuber but where else are you going to see a clutch spring flex or weld stitching their way across some sheet metal or the front end of a range rover coming together seemingly by magic or a lotus esprit winking at you and these are the things that make it all worth it for me you know soup videos get a lot of comments along the lines of he must have put a lot of time into this, which I'm very appreciative of. But what I'd rather somebody took away from all this is that I managed to achieve what is considered to be an average restoration time. Let's say three years build. Granted, I was doing it full time, but I had this process in my way. The time that stop motion demanded of me is the same kind of time that you have to spend doing things that aren't working on your car so make the most of it if you've got a saturday afternoon if you've got the whole weekend look at you go to it like i say in the very first episode of soup if you're just plugging away at it whenever you can eventually you will drive that car and have a huge sense of achievement too This is my full-time gig. I'm very proud of it. I'm very happy to be doing it. Like I said already, it's not a clever way of doing YouTube. All the more reason why your support is greatly appreciated. Anything you can do to help, whether it be a like, a share, a comment, all very valuable to me, by the way, or some direct financial aid, pitching the series to your favorite forum, whatever you can do is a great help. And that's it. Finishing this video means I've got a kind of rare couple hours to myself. So I'm off to drink a beer and have some fun. In the meantime, plan your next little bit of work on the car. And I'll see you soon. Mind bullets, it's the future.